the uh, petroleum industry uh, covers a, a lot of different fields, a lot of different topics. And many, many times during the uh, period of development of the technology in the uh, petroleum industry, there were overlaps. Various companies were all working on similar projects in that. And we hope uh, in uh, the papers that will be presented today that we bring out the names of some of the individuals uh, who participated in many of these uh, activities. And so therefore, uh, uh, if you know of names of people who might be important in these various fields, don't hesitate uh, in the question period to bring their names up so that we can uh, actually incorporate uh, them uh, also in this. Now, we started a program uh, actually at the uh, Las Vegas meeting uh, of asking various petroleum companies to contribute uh, photographs and pictures and posters of uh, significant uh, technical achievements that their company uh, had made and felt they should be recognized for. We displayed these at the uh, reception uh, for the uh, dinner, uh, petroleum division dinner, and then uh, made an agreement with the uh, companies that we would uh, contribute all of these to the Chemical Heritage Foundation for a permanent archive so that historians and students in the future would have an opportunity to benefit uh, from uh, both the pictures and uh, documents and write-ups. Uh, uh, many of the preprints pre uh, for the meetings have been submitted there, but we intend to continue to do that to build a history uh, on the uh, uh, petroleum division. So if your company uh, has an interest and uh, would like to participate in, in, in this, uh, we'd certainly like to work with you to uh, try to do that. And uh, you'll see some of the uh, slides that are used today actually uh, are from the archives at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Um, is there a representative of the Chemical Heritage Foundation here? Uh, there probably will be uh, later, so uh, possibly they can uh, comment on this too. Uh, in uh, recognizing uh, the individuals that were significant in uh, various technical developments uh, in the uh, petroleum industry, uh, the speakers are also quite a distinguished list of people. Uh, these people uh, have uh, been actively involved and uh, made major contributions uh, on their own, uh, in addition to the people that they'll be recognizing in their papers. And, uh, and uh, probably one of, one of the most prominent individuals in the Petroleum Division is uh, Dr. Ola, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, his work on hydrocarbon uh, chemistry. Uh, and uh, we're looking very for uh, very much uh, to the comments uh, that he has to make. And the first paper uh, is the historical <coughs> aspects of hydrocarbon chemistry by Dr. Cole. I don't think I need it. First of all, I want to congratulate you to find this place, which is <laughs> quite an achievement. Also, I personally feel that airports and convention centers shouldn't be designed by people who are very young. They should be obliged that they should walk equal distances for half a year before they start to design their structure. Anyhow, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I won't show you any transparencies or slides. I would like to give you a very brief uh, summary of what I think is some historical perspective of the field. Let me, uh, to begin with, make a few comments in general. Why you need historical perspectives? I don't think you can talk about science or technology at all without putting it in its proper historical framework. You see, we proud ourselves very much that at the beginning, at the 21st century, we have supposedly a fairly substantial knowledge. Now, this is, of course, a very relative term. Think back that it was only slightly more than 200 years ago that the Industrial Revolution took place. And I think we achieved a fair amount, of course. Many are questioning this. Uh, if you look at the word as it today, petroleum uh, chemistry, I would, I would generalize it. I really would say that it's basically hydrocarbon chemistry because hydrocarbons are the compounds which make up petroleum oil, natural gas, a 
and go. Now, Mother Nature gave these as a present to us, and we are using them. And we are using them at a very good clip. Oh, in the continental United States, I guess it was, what, 130-some uh, years ago, that around the small town of Titusville in Pennsylvania, uh, petroleum industry started. <coughs> and it started by the fact that people realized that some gluey stuff was seeping up from the ground, which you can scoop up can burn it in lamps and use it otherwise, but it was not a very efficient operation. And some people had the good <coughs> idea that if you, if this comes up from the ground, if you poke into the ground, maybe it will come up better. This was the beginning of drilling operation at very modest level. And then, of course, they realized that the stuff can't be used very well as it comes out of the ground, so you must what's now called refining. And the refining industry sprung up, very simple by today's standard. And it was a young entrepreneur in Cleveland, Ohio, called J.D. Rockefeller, who then uh, started to acquire some of these refining companies and started one of the, the major operations which became known as the Standard Oil Company. I won't go into this aspect. I just said that uh, in the early 1910s, one of the major antitrust actions was to split up the Standard Oil Company. I guess two years ago it was put together by the ExxonMobil merger. And nobody really uh, even remarked on this. They were all occupied to split up Microsoft petroleum industry can be blamed for a lot of things, but it's about it. Now, I said that basically what we are dealing is really hydrocarbons. And as long nature is giving us this unbelievable gift, now really it's an unbelievable gift regardless of price fluctuation, a barrel of oil still costs around, what, 30 bucks with some variation. And for this, you get 42 gallons delivered. I don't think you can buy water at this price delivered to you. So it's, it's an enormous bargain, and, and we are using it, and we are going to continue to use it. And there, of course, is one, one drawback that it won't last forever. Now, how long it lasts is, of course, is, is, is a relative term. Certainly, I don't need to worry about it. Looking around, I don't think you need to worry about it. <laughs> but uh, our grandchildren and their children certainly will need to worry about it. And therefore, men will be called upon to find new resources. Now, when I look back at the history of hydrocarbons, it really started from, from oil and oil refining. And others will, will talk about it with much more competence and details. And the way the refining industry developed and the way cracking and other operations developed are really milestones of, of uh, the petroleum hydrocarbon industry in our country and for this reason in the world. You see, I mentioned Rockefeller. Maybe I should mention also Nobel. It's less known. But Alfred Nobel, who made his fortune out of dynamite, which incidentally was an essential explosive without which uh, modern technology couldn't have developed. You couldn't have built roads and tunnels and harbors and so on. Of course, there is always a downside. If you have an explosive, you can also kill your fellow man. And therefore, people generally associate it with the downside. So anyhow, the Nobel family made their fortune in the Baku region of, of the Caucasian mountains. They had the first uh, license from the Tsar to develop oil in Russia. Now, when you look back at, at further development, uh, you can see that the pioneers of the field were really people who developed means to use oil 
petroleum sources in a more efficient way. And this, of course, reflected first uh, finding ways to chemically break down the heavies to allow them to separate and so on. And there were giants of, of refining processes, and it still continues. Uh, after all, if you consider that from hydroforming to platforming, using all modern catalytic zeolites and so on. But these are milestones and it continues. And uh, therefore we can be very proud of this, this heritage. Now, I will say a few more words about people who were involved with transforming uh, hydrocarbons into different products and useful products and allow the better use. And I could just mention a few major names, like Poudry, who came from France and developed his, his process and made major impact, and Ipatyev, who came from Russia at the age of close to 60, couldn't speak English, and uh, basically was essential with his association with Universal Oil Program to develop the, the foundation of, of modern hydrocarbon petroleum chemistry with his associates, who included uh, Pines and Hensel and Schwerling and others. Now, some of you may know this, but I want to mention that Universal Oil Products for, I think, five years in the early 30s had two people in both uh, what now called homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. Ipatia fed it up effort in homogeneous catalysis and pioneered fundamentals, and Tropsch had an effort in heterogeneous catalysis. Yes, it's uh, Tropsch of Fischer Tropsch. He retired from Germany, who spent five years here, and became very sick, had gone back and died very young. So in the 30s, there was a, a very significant development in, in the understanding of how you can do hydrocarbon transformation and lay the foundation. Now, there wasn't much interest in it at the time. And whereas isomerization, alkylation, and other fundamental processes, the fundamentals of their, their processes was established, it was really World War II which brought this in, in focus. You know, there is something in, in human nature. Uh, we are doing our most uh, spectacular efforts in wartime. Look at atomic energy. See, with, with all what's going on in, in uh, politically attacking atomic energy, unfortunately, <coughs> in the public's mind, atomic energy is connected with the bomb. And during World War II, nobody objected to this effort. That the country in two and a half years developed the most efficient device. Oh, of course, you can also use everything else to the benefit of mankind or also to efficiently kill your fellow man. I personally believe that we have no choice in the future. As our fossil fuel, hydrocarbon oil gas reserves are diminishing. We will have a great need to produce energy from what we know today. And what we know today, the only energy source which is practically unlimited and which is clean. Now why I emphasize in clean, and I would say a few words to this in some historical perspective. Of course, when you burn any hydrocarbon, any fossil fuel, the carbon content goes up at carbon dioxide. And there is a worldwide concern these days about global warming due to excessive burning of, of hydrocarbon. Now, I don't want to get involved in this, but I think for the future I need to emphasize something. Nobody questions that six billion people have an effect on nature. Of course, nobody talks about it because it's politically not accessible. I mean, you, you shouldn't really mention it. You offend different people. So you just, you just blame everything 
and burning hydrocarbons. And it's wonderful to blame it on the big oil industry and so on. Now, it also quoted that Arrhenius, a Swedish physical chemist, wrote 100 years ago a paper in which he showed the relationship between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and temperature. Incidentally, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is present in, in uh, I think, uh, 35, 10 thousandths of a percent concentration, 350 parts per million. Uh, this considerable less than the noble gas ergo is present in the atmosphere, but it's significant for, for celestial life. Now, I am not sure that you can say that because there's a relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature, which causes it. After all, if I'm not mistaken, humankind was around only for a relative short period of time on planet Earth. And there were innumerable ice ages and subsequent warming periods. But man wasn't around, so we can't be blamed if we weren't around. Mother Nature still had its cycle. And it's not unreasonable to think that this still goes on. Now, human activity is superimposed. And because it's superimposed, we should try to do our best to mitigate it. But mitigate it in a sensible way. And what I'm trying to, to come at is that when you look back historically, uh, where really hydrocarbons came, how uh, it was first coal or coal tar, then there was synthetic effort in the later part of the 19th century in Germany. Calcium carbide was the source of acetylene which started some synthetic uh, chemistry. The later 19th and 20th century then blossomed out using oil and gas on a massive scale, which you are still doing. But eventually this will slow down. It won't disappear overnight, but certainly decreasing supplies and increasing demand will start a spiral, a real spiral, where we need to do something. And if you ask me how I see the future, I think it's, it's probably proper at this time to reflect very briefly on, on the future. Now, what we have now, of course, there are new directions in hydrocarbon chemistry. We have what some call green chemistry. We try to do things better, cleaner, safer. To me, green chemistry also means making money. After all, there's nothing wrong making money. The only reason why private industry exists is to make a profit. And uh, doing things in an environmentally more friendly way probably is, is a goal which we can achieve. Now, I mentioned something about carbon dioxide and it's uh, additive effect on climate change. Now, I think that it's not an unreasonable approach, therefore, to say that if the trouble is that there is too much CO2 which we put up in the air, how about if we would take out some of the CO2 and recycle it? Now, Mother Nature, of course, does it in photosynthesis, but there are two problems with it. First of all, we have overpopulated already the Earth and with 10 billion people who will be around in 50 or 70 years, nature's recycling ability won't suffice. Secondly, plants are not turning themselves into oil and gas in a short period of time. And we can't say time out, now we wait for uh, 50 million years and then we restart again. Now one way is to use carbon dioxide of the atmosphere as a raw material. And by chemistry, you see, much maligned chemistry can, can do things. We already know in the laboratory that you can turn carbon dioxide back into, say, uh, methanol and through this to all the hydrocarbons we are using now. Of course, we need energy for this. We need a hydrogen source. But of course, man needs energy anyhow without really predicting things which are difficult, particularly concerning the future, I think that men will use atomic energy on a massive scale, albeit made safer 
There's nothing wrong to make it safer. And we can make it safer if we produce the bomb in, in two and a half years. Nobody will convince me that we can't make atomic reactors and they use safer and develop new, more efficient uh, reactors. And also we can dispose the radioactive waste by either separating the very long-lived isotopes and, and using them differently, or by storage. Now, there is again politics involved. Uh, environmentalists, I'm an environmentalist, I have grandchildren, I care for their future. But I'm an environmentalist who said, let's do things in a sensible way where we find solutions. Now this depository we built for billions and billions of dollars under Utah Mountain supposedly is still in limbo because now the argument is that they agree that it's probably safe for 10,000 of a year, maybe 50,000 years. But extremely said it's not good enough. We should make it at least good for 100,000 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I certainly don't have personal interest in, in uh, years like this. I don't think you have either. I don't know how long Homo sapiens will be around on planet Earth. Uh, there may happen natural disasters over which we have no control. Hopefully we won't kill each of other. But if mankind sticks around, I can assure you that 50,000 years from now, they will have a hell of a lot more knowledge and will be much more advanced technologically and will solve their own problems. So what I'm saying is that the history of hydrocarbon chemistry grew out of trying to use something what nature gave us. It grew out by finding ways to extract it, to refine it, to transform it, with all the miracles of chemistry and make all the materials we use, from high octane gasoline to uh, plastics and materials and all other things. And eventually, when the inevitable pressure between decreasing availability of resources and increasing demands will build up, I think that chemists, and I'm very proud to be a chemist, you know, I am not a hyphenated chemist. I am not a bio-hyphenated chemist or a chemical physicist or whatever. I am proud to be a chemist. And as a matter of fact, I am even proud to be a hydrocarbon chemist. Now, well, you know, hydrocarbons basically are the basis of organic chemistry. Once they said that organic chemistry is a chemistry of carbon compounds. But you know, there are a lot of carbon compounds which we gave to our inorganic friends. <laughs> Look at all these buckyballs and fullerenes and a lot of other things. So hydrocarbons really basically are a very big chunk of chemistry. And those of us who have interest to concentrate basically on carbon hydrogen compounds but there are a lot of chemists to do wonderful synthesis and complex systems, wonderful. On the other hand, it's also, I think, wonderful and even more important to build hydrocarbons from simple building blocks, one carbon building blocks. And fissure drops use synthesis gas, which at the time was a great approach, but I don't think it's the approach to the future. So my vision is that chemists will indeed able to handle, to convert carbon dioxide to all the hydrocarbon we need and fuels, and in turn, they will also mitigate global warming or climate change. And don't kid yourself, we can't affect basically the climate. There will be periods of nature. And I have good news for you. It's a hell of a lot more pleasant to live in a warming period than in a cooling period. Future generation will, if they stick around, hit again a cooling period, and they will need to worry how they can increase the temperature instead of trying to mitigate. But we have a wonderful field of chemistry, in hydrocarbon chemistry, and we had many giants of the field who blessed us, going back from some of the mentioned people who, who pioneered really basic hydrocarbon chemistry to people who pioneered 
homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, catalysis for people who build polymers like Sigla and Nata and many, many others. And there will be new generation, new generation who will, who will bring what's needed for mankind to circumvent these difficulties and who will make this hydrocarbon from other sources. So I am very pleased to be here. I think that this division is probably not the most popular now between the ACS division, but have courage. I have seen in my lifetime these up and downs in, in popularity of fields. Uh, I have a very great admiration for biologically related systems, but biohyphenated chemistry is not the only chemistry. I think that as years pass by, there will be more and more need for new generation of hydrocarbon chemists who can get solution to mankind to an important field. Thank you very much for your time.